Welcome to our session today on building a resume. My name is Melissa Schertz and I'm a career specialist here at the College of DuPage. Today we're going to talk about tips and tricks for building an effective resume. And I want you to keep in mind that no two resumes are alike. So today, the information I'm going through, I want you to kind of take and use in your own unique way. Um, your resume is unique to you and it's going to be adapted based on how you utilize your resume. I will be showing some samples today during the session. Um, those samples are for educational purposes only. And so what I mean by that is, that resume isn't the golden resume, it's just a tool, a guideline for you to follow. Um, again, we can continue to improve even our own samples because your resume is always a living and breathing document. So they are purely just for reference purposes. We're going to go through three main topics today. So I'm going to first start with um, discussing a resume, its purpose, and the difference between a resume and a job application. I'm then going to walk through content, what to include, what not to include, and I'll start with very basic information all the way down to the type of detail that you need to include in terms of experience and volunteer work. And then we're going to wrap up with guidelines and trends. Um, you know, what should a resume look like now? Um, what's kind of going away? And then I will end with some frequently, frequently asked questions. So let's first start off with talking about the difference between a resume and a job application. So this is a question I get a lot in my office as a career specialist. You know, it's really important to understand the difference between a resume and the application and the purpose between them. So a resume is a document you create. You're going to build that document based on the information you want the employer to know. So it's unique to you and your resume is going to be different based on the context it's going toward. A job application, however, is created by the employer. So they are essentially building this form that they want you to complete. They're asking you key questions that are essential in order for them to decide whether or not to choose you for a particular position. So the question I get is, my resume has a lot of similar information that's in the job application. Do I need to put in the same information? The answer is yes. So do not put C your resume in the job application itself. Don't leave information blank in the application. By doing so, you send this message that, hey, your question wasn't important enough for me to answer, and it kind of sends this message of laziness to the employer. So to be fully considered for the position, you have to complete that application, and your resume is just adapted along the lines of the particular position you're applying for. Um, so make sure to fill out every single aspect of that application. If you do have questions about that, um, you know, if there is an aspect of the application you're unable to answer or you're not quite sure, that's why we are here as career services. You can always come visit and meet with us to learn a little bit more about that process. So let's get into content, um, what to include, what not to include. So the very first thing that should be listed on your resume, and I laugh because people tend to forget this piece of information, is your name. So the very first line on your resume needs to be your name. It should be bold in the center and it should stand out. You also need your address on there, phone number, email address, along with a LinkedIn URL. And so I include this information because it might be self-explanatory, but believe it or not, the most common resume mistakes are those simple ones. So as a career specialist reviewing resumes day in and day out, I see these sorts of silly errors where people forget their name, they forget their address, they don't put a phone number, they don't put an email address. So I want all of you watching today to not make those silly mistakes and to use this as a checklist to go through to make sure you have all of that key information. When it comes to the phone number, list just one phone number, not a home number. Um, you know, most people nowadays have a cell phone number, so list the number that's going to reach you the easiest. Um, if someone else answers that number, make sure you are around that phone if you are sending out resumes to employers so that you are the one that answers when they call. Make sure your email address is professional. I'll talk about that here in a little bit. And then the LinkedIn URL is a trend that we're seeing. Employers are on LinkedIn, they're using it to search candidates. Oftentimes, if they get your resume, they will look for your LinkedIn profile. So by having that URL to your profile on there, it invites them to your profile and it helps them see that you are there. 
If you need help with LinkedIn, we offer workshops on that. You can certainly visit the Career Services website, which I will show you at the end of the session today. After all of your contact information is laid out on the resume, we need to have an introductory section. So for years, this was an objective statement. And you may see objectives on many samples today if you do any research on resumes, but the trend is going away from objectives. By the time a resume makes it to an employer, they already know what your objective is and it should be their job. So we no longer state the obvious. Instead, we incorporate what's called a professional summary. And now you can title this section differently based on your preferences. So you could title it a professional summary, you could call it a profile, career summary, or career focus. Either way, we just steer clear of the objective. So instead of stating what you're seeking, we kind of blend that message together in three to four lines with what you have to offer in that position. So this section should consist of what are you seeking, but your value, your skills, what are your interests that align with the goal of that job? Really, why should the employer pay attention to you? This helps bring some uh, context to your resume. So if you have a differing work history than the job you're applying for, it helps the employer know that you recognize it's a different opportunity, but that you understand how your skills can transfer in. So I have a sample here for you, and I love this sample because it's a humanities student, and I see a lot of students that maybe have a broad major or a broad degree, and they're not quite sure how to tie in their summary or explain what an employer is looking for. So this particular student has talked about their verbal and communication skills and that they have strong communication skills. And what employer wouldn't want that? Every employer out there wants someone who is a communicator. This student also has a really great understanding of diverse cultures, and they've developed that from their classes along with their work experience. And being a humanities student, they are able to understand different perspectives and critically think. So, you know, based on those particular skill sets, the student has put that summary together to capture that message. And the student is also bilingual. So, you know, so if they're working at or planning to work at a global company, a company that does international business, that is a crucial skill employers look for. They look for that bilingual ability. So this student has also incorporated that into the summary because this is one of those first sections that the employer will see. Keep it succinct, however, it's not supposed to be a life story. It's short and to the point. This is a section I find most students struggle with. So if you do have challenges with this section, you're not sure where to begin, you can certainly reach out to our office. I have students meet with me daily and they will bring in a summary. I will work on a summary with them. So if you're not sure where to begin, again, we're a great resource on campus. After the professional summary comes education. Now this is dependent upon um, your level of education and kind of where you're at in your career. So education goes next if you're currently enrolled or you've graduated within the last year or so. So if your education is fairly recent. If you've graduated outside of the last year or so, then education moves down. But this is very industry specific. So if you're not 100% sure of where education needs to go, I would meet with a career specialist because this might be on an individual basis. Um, however, Education goes toward the top if you're currently enrolled, for sure. And if you're currently at College of DuPage, you would list College of DuPage first. Now, if you've attended a single college course, whether it be here at College of DuPage or another college, um, we remove high school. So you take off high school, even if you just take one class, you don't have to be degree seeking. Um, we just remove high school because now employers are going to focus on that college education and that sort of training. So in this section, you wanna list degrees, certificates, coursework. GPA is totally optional, though those students seeking an internship, I would encourage you to list a GPA if it's above a 3.2. Keep in mind, everything you put on your resume is fair game for the employer to ask you about, so you wanna make sure that you're confident and comfortable with it. And then related coursework. This is a really great option if you're early on in your degree, but you have a particular class that you want to highlight for the employer. It gives you the opportunity to tell them you have some great foundational knowledge and you don't have to list out everything, but just give them kind of a taste of the classes that you've taken. So the sample here I have for you, um, this is a paralegal student. So this paralegal student is doing the associate in applied science degree. So we write out the full degree title here. We don't just write 
write AAS. So you want to avoid abbreviations. You want to include your major if you have one or that academic program of study. We need to include the date that you're expected to complete. Now I know a lot of students are going part-time, maybe they've just started and they have no idea when they expect to complete their program and that's totally fine. You can state your dates attended, so your start date to present. As you get closer to that completion date, then you would say expected completion and list the month and year. And you can update that as time goes on, but make sure you're pretty confident with the dates that you list. You can see here for this paralegal studies student, um, they didn't list all of their coursework. They listed a few, so they wanted the employer to see legal drafting, but they've also taken English composition and speech communication. They want the employer to see that they're able to present themselves well and communicate effectively with clients. Um, so list no more than six courses there. The other key piece to think about here is employers won't know, you know, College of DuPage course codes, so you wouldn't want to list education 1100. They won't know what that is. You have to write out the course title and write it out fully. Don't abbreviate. I have two samples here. So this first one, as you can see, this student's education is a little bit different because they are attending College of DuPage, but they also already have a bachelor's degree. So what's important to note here is you always list your education in reverse chronological order. So you list your most recent school, wherever you're currently attending first, and then earlier education toward the bottom. And then corresponding dates, as I mentioned before, and again, GPA is totally optional, as this student has listed here. Now this other um, sample here is very similar to the paralegal student. Um, however, this student is actually pursuing multiple credentials at College of DuPage. So the way that you would order this is the most recent. So anything ongoing and then anything already completed and then everything else below. So again, GPA relevant coursework, totally optional, but you do wanna incorporate everything you're pursuing. Now, if you're not pursuing a degree or credential, we have a lot of professionals that come to COD to complete a course, to build a skill essential for the workplace. You can list that single course as well. You can state currently completing a course in QuickBooks, and that is acceptable. Employers want to know what it is that you're completing, so don't just list the school and nothing else. You have to specify what that is. Next, after education, we go into professional experience. So this is a lot of information here. Um, this section can be broken up into multiple sections based on the type of experience. So what I mean by that is if you have volunteer work, internships, and work experience, and that section is looking very, very lengthy, we can break it up. This really helps the employer. Anything you can do visually to help the employer read the resume and know where their eyes should fall will be helpful to them. Um, you want to, however, match those sections up so that there's consistent formatting throughout. So we don't want the reader or the employer to have to jump around looking for key pieces of information. It should be easy and it should flow for them. So for your work experience, you have to make sure that you list the name of the employer, or if it's volunteer work, the name of the nonprofit or the volunteer organization. You have to list the location, but all you need is the city and the state. You don't need the full address on the resume. You need your job title, position title. Again, for volunteer work, you would just put volunteer, or you can specify. If you've had a very specific role as a volunteer, you can list that title. You know, if you were a fundraising volunteer, note that as the title as opposed to just saying volunteer in general. And then employers love dates. So we have to list the corresponding month and year that you worked at that place of employment. So you need your start date and your end date, but you don't need the specific day that you started. Be sure to write out the whole month name don't abbreviate, write out the full month. We have to be formal on the resume, and again, we avoid those abbreviations. Now, underneath each experience, whether it's an internship, a job, volunteer work, you need some sort of description so the employer knows what you did, and it helps them understand the skills that you've built up and the employable qualities that they're looking for. So this sample here I love because I see many students who come to me and they will say, Melissa, I'm working just a part-time job right now to make some extra cash to pay for books. It's totally unrelated to my career. Do I need to include that on my resume? 
The answer is yes, because employers want to see that track record and they want to know what you're capable of. They wanna see that you're a loyal employee and that you can be managed. And we need a description there. So for this example here, I came up with this example, this fancy title of a pizza engineer. And for this position, this student, has a lot of customer service experience. And so instead of just putting customer service or cashiering, you know, I always like to have that conversation with students to say, there's a lot that goes into cashiering. Tell me what you do on a daily basis. And we come up with an entire list of skills and tasks that they complete. So clearly just putting cashiering isn't doing them any justice, it's not enough. So instead we break up those tasks but we create more of impact statements. So we don't just list out the task, we don't just list the duty, we describe how it was accomplished. So my favorite bullet point in this sample is actually the last one. So collaborate with fellow pizza engineers to cook and deliver orders in a timely manner. I love that bullet point because we learn three skills and characteristics in that one bullet about this worker. So we learn that the student is able to collaborate, they have teamwork, they're able to work with others to accomplish a task. We also learn that they're able to follow through on a task and they can complete a project. And then we learn that they have to do it by an assigned deadline. Um, so they have time management. So instead of just stating made pizzas, we're able to capture those key skills and qualities employers are looking for by creating an impact statement. You want three to five impact statements per job per volunteer position, per internship, per clinical, whatever the professional experience is, you need three to five bullet points to describe it. If you have six or seven bullet points, it's not the end of the world, but once you get into eight to 10 bullet points, you may deter the reader from your resume altogether. And our goal is to keep them interested and captivated in the document so we don't have too much text that would scare them away. We wanna keep them interested. We'd rather they read some of it versus skipping it altogether. Some key things to remember when it comes to professional experience. So action words. So each bullet point should begin with an action word. Complete, compile, develop, coordinate. The action words should vary throughout. So it's very easy to get an action word stuck in your head, but try to vary them so that you're not repeating yourself. You also want to be mindful of verb tenses. So if you are talking about a job you're no longer holding, it should be a past tense action verb. If you are discussing information related to a current job, you need to use present tense verbs. So be very careful with that because oftentimes students will say they're great with details, but then they mix up their verb tenses on the resume and the resume is no longer supporting that they're great with details. So make sure all of that aligns. Also choose the appropriate word and you don't have to be too fancy with it. So your resume is your own. It should sound like you. You will be the one in the interview owning that resume, supporting that resume. So make sure you're comfortable with the phrasing. So don't get too fancy, but just make sure you are differentiating your phrasing and the words that you're using. Now after education, professional experience, these additional sections are optional. These are kind of supplemental sections. These are sections that you may or may not have, or you may list on a resume for job A, but you may not have on a resume for job B. So again, you're adapting your resume based on where it's going in the target audience. If you are technologically savvy, certainly include computer skills or technical skills. Be sure to list them out. Uh, for example, Microsoft Office is a large software suite. So you need to list out the individual programs within Microsoft Office. So you would need to say Microsoft Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, and any additional programs from that suite if you are versed in them. But if you put Microsoft Office and you only know Excel and Word, the employer might think you know everything, that you know Outlook as well. So you have to make sure you specify. You also need to write out the program name. So don't just put MS Office. You would need to write out the whole word, Microsoft Office. Again, if you're bilingual, multilingual, add a section for that and specify the languages. If you're part of a club or an organization on campus, that's a great way to get some experience and that's a, a great heading to have on your resume. It shows employers you're active. It shows employers you're really interested in your major, that you're involved outside of class. Um, I wanna go 
back to volunteer work. Volunteer work is as valuable as work experience. It tells employers that you're interested in acquiring skills for other reasons besides getting a paycheck. So if you have volunteer work, don't be afraid to list that on your resume. And you can also title it community involvement if you'd like, um, if you wanna change up the headings. And then any leadership experience. So leadership is a quality we're finding employers are looking for more and more often. It comes up in all of their uh, survey results in terms of the type of qualities they seek in a candidate. So if you have any leadership experience, whether you've led a group toward a common goal, um, that counts. You don't necessarily have to have held a leadership position to have leadership experience. If you have held a leadership position, certainly note that on your resume. That's valuable to an employer. But if you've ever motivated a group, motivated a team, took the lead on a project, and accomplished a goal, definitely note that so employers see that you have leadership experience. And then any of these sections, like I said, are totally optional. So you choose what you would like to have on that document. So we're gonna roll into additional tips, tricks, and trends now. So in terms of formatting, you want to make sure that it is simple. Your resume does not have to be a fancy document. The simpler, the better. Odds are you're applying for a job online and most online applications are going to have to interpret your resume before a person physically reads it. So you have to make sure it's simple, it's not overly fancy with text boxes. I actually recommend avoiding text boxes, um, but make sure it's still visually appealing so when it does make it to a reader, they are e it, it's easy for them to scan through it and find the key information they're looking for. To differentiate sections, you wanna make sure that you bold your headings. Now, in terms of style, this is where you can put your own spin on the document. So you can either center all of your headings if you'd like, or you can left align all of them. The most important thing here is to make sure your headings are all consistent. So if you center one heading, all of those headings need to be in the center. If you left align one, all of them need to be left aligned. So that is totally up to you, that's personal preference. And make sure to use proofreaders. And I'm not just talking about looking for grammatical errors or misspellings. This is important to make sure that your resume makes sense to someone else besides yourself. We all know our experience, it's all in our mind. And when we write our resumes, it makes sense to us, but it needs to make sense to those that have never met us before. Oftentimes employers will get your resume and they've never met you. They're just seeing this piece of paper, this document on a screen that is trying to summarize what you're capable of. So you have to make sure the messaging makes sense. So have several people read it. You could certainly have friends and family members, um, but give it to someone that's going to give an honest opinion because employers are going to be really honest when they read a resume. Um, and you wanna make sure you're not making any mistakes in terms of how you're describing yourself. In terms of length, this is a common question I receive. The resume should be no more than two pages. However, it needs to be at least one and a half pages to justify that second page. So if your resume is a page and a couple of lines on page two, then you need to keep it to one page so it's this nice clean document. Um, even the professionals with the most experience should not go beyond two pages. It is a two page maximum. There are employers out there that won't read a three pager, so make sure you're staying within that two page range. Another detail that is overlooked is the save name. And so I kind of chuckle at that because not everyone's aware that employers can see your save name when you upload a resume. So if you have resume version 253, they're going to see that file name when you upload it. And we wanna make sure that your file name is professional. Every detail we are sending to the employer needs to make a solid, positive impression. We don't want them to see a save name with the company of another job you've applied to. So when you save your resume, you need to change it every time. You might end up with multiple versions of your resume and that's what I recommend. So save it as your full name, the name of the job you're applying to, and then the company. And make sure you send the correct resume to the correct company. This is also important so that if you get a call for an interview, 
you know the exact resume you sent that employer and that's the resume you bring with you to the interview because that's what got you the interview in the first place. You don't want to go in with a resume that looks totally different and that surprises the employer. Now I mentioned this a little bit earlier, email address. Make sure your email address is professional. You could certainly use your College of DuPage email address. That is a professional email address. Um, you may have a fun email address and that's fine, but I would recommend creating a new one, a professional one, just for your job search to make sure it is sending the right message. You could have it align with your career. So the example I have here is Culinary Chef 25. So if you are a culinary student, you could create Still a fun email address, but it's professional. Um, we want an email address that the employer knows they're getting the, the right person when they send the email, but then again, it sends the right message. So I have some poor examples over here on the left. We don't wanna do that. And then I have some better examples over here on the right of the screen. And then I have a sample here for you. So in this sample, you can see that this student has an internship experience and then they also have some additional experience and we've broken it up by sections. So for the internship, we wanted it to stand out, which is why it's under its own section. This is a marketing student. So we've put that internship under a marketing experience heading and then everything else in terms of experience is under additional experience, but it's further down the page. So it's not necessarily the focus focus of the resume, but we're still providing that key information employers look for. This sample and other samples are available on the Career Services website. You can check those out. You can come meet with one of us and we can give you some samples. We can provide a sample that we feel would fit best with your career interests. Again, this is just a reference point. And I want to go into some frequently asked questions. And so, you know, Filling out a job application is a very timely process. You have to set aside a lot of time and so it gets very challenging to keep up on the applications and it's very tempting to rush through them. And so you want to take your time with it because you need to make the best impression possible. So try your best to not rush through. You need to make a great impression and the application and the resume is what's going to get you in the door for the interview. Your resume does not get you the job. So this first question, can I send the same resume to multiple employers? The answer is no. So it might be very tempting to send out multiple resumes, send out a hundred of your resumes to employers thinking you might increase your chances of getting an interview, but employers have very strict criteria for each job they post. So it's important that you adapt your resume to that criteria, otherwise it may not make it through for the employer to see. So you're better off sending very targeted resumes and that you're very strategic with that process so that you increase your chances of that resume making it through. Employers tend to scan and screen your resume based on the requirements of their job. So you might send out a fantastic resume, but if your resume doesn't speak their language, it's gonna get stuck at the wall and they'll never see it. And then you spent all this time for your resume to kind of be filtered out. So make sure you're adapting it. The next question I get is, my work history is unrelated to what I wanna do. Do I include that information? The answer is yes. Again, I spoke to this a little bit earlier. Your resume um, tells them about your employment um, and your characteristics for employment. So they wanna see, do you have a track record? Can you be managed? Can you take direction? Are you loyal? Um, it, it helps them see, okay, are we taking a risk or are we not taking a risk with this potential candidate? If you have work history, definitely list it so they see you're employable. Now, in terms of how much experience to list, um, really only the last 10 to 15 years are required on your resume. So this comes to my third question, how far back should I go? It really depends on the career you're targeting. So last 10 or 15 years in terms of your work history, anything prior to that time frame can fall off the resume. However, if you are targeting something that is highly relevant to an experience outside of that time frame, then include it on there. 
So for example, if I work with a job seeker who maybe worked in accounting and then they took time off, they took 10 years off, but now they wanna get back into accounting, we need to list that accounting experience so that the employer sees that they have the ability to perform their job and that it makes sense as to why they're applying. So if you're wondering about this time frame, maybe you're hesitant to list um, information from before the time frame, or you're not comfortable with only listing the last 10 years and you're not sure where to begin, that's a great time to come see a career specialist so we can have that conversation with you about whether or not to include previous experience. But generally it's the last 10 years and that's typically what employers are going to ask for on a job application. So that brings me to the end of the session today. Um, on here I have our contact information. You can certainly reach out to the Career Services Center if you have any questions or if you have kind of a unique situation and you wanna meet one-on-one -on -one in an appointment, we can go over that with you. Um, you can email our office, you can visit our website, you can follow us on social media. We are on Pinterest, Twitter, and Instagram and we have a lot of great resources available at your fingertips and we're happy to help. So thank you for watching today. And again, I'm Melissa Schertz from the Career Services Center.